Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so today we're going to be talking about something that's not similar to what you've seen this past week. Um, we're going to work on more educational and uh, talk about in the, or talk about the industry and collegiate gap. Before we do that, I wanted to introduce ourselves. So my name is John Fan. I'm a third year undergraduate student at Purdue University. I'm pursuing a couple of degrees. Um, and I'm also a researcher in natural language processing. My name is Ryan Tom. I'm also an uh, undergraduate at Purdue University in my third year. I'm studying cybersecurity and psychology. Uh, my name is Tyler Peatman. I'm a third year undergraduate uh, student at Purdue University studying cybersecurity and psychology. So before we get into the meat and potatoes of our talk, I just wanted to walk us through what we're going to be talking about, the talking points that we'll cover. So we'll go into a little bit of background over what we're actually talking about. We'll talk about the current um, approaches to, for joint uh, connections for industry and education. We'll talk about what more we can do. And we'll talk about how you guys can leave your own impact on the future generation of the workforce. So when we were researching this topic, we found some really surprising statistics. Um, 18 months after hiring new hires, 46% of those new hires leave. Um, they either fail out or they, get, they don't get the, enough training to last. Um, this lost productivity from inadequate training costs employers an average of 1 to 2.5 of total revenue. And that may seem a little bit low, but when you're working in a $2 billion industry, that's millions of dollars lost. So here's what we're currently doing at Purdue University to help the future workforce connect with industries and employers. We have on-campus company recruitment, we have company information sessions, um, we have industry donations in the form of either monetary or equipment, um, we have co-op and internship programs that are facilitated from career fairs. That's a lot and we're privileged to have that at a big university like ourselves, but it's not enough to help smaller universities and it's not enough to help everyone. So. What we propose is an investment in the future. We want more employer engagement at an individual level, not just mass recruiting, but finding out what Ryan here wants to do with his life, well, how you can help him fulfill his goals so that he can help you fulfill your organizational needs. Join industrial advisory boards. These are oftentimes um, councils that help colleges create a curriculum that you guys want for your, in, for your um, corporation. So if you want students to know BGP coming out of college, you can join these industrial advisory boards and propose curriculum changes to add that. Sponsor events and training programs. The number one thing um, that helps us learn is hands-on training. These things help us learn what you guys want us to do. Be like Nanog and sponsor conferences, um, do interpersonal networking with people that are actually in the field. Before I came to college, I knew nothing and no one within the field, and I found a mentor. That mentor helped guide me through what college was like and what information security and networking really is. And on the note of mentorship opportunities, Ryan would like to share his experiences. All right, so I'm gonna go a little bit more in depth with <clears throat> some of these career building opportunities, specifically mentorships. What a lot of these things have in common is uh, these three things to the left that you see. So hands-on experience. A lot of these give uh, opportunities to students to have hands-on experience in the field, whether that is configuring switches, implementing networking routes, doing something hands-on and technical that gives them the experience, but is different than the classic theory that they learn in the classroom. Furthermore, it gives them networking, not only the technical networking skills that a lot of you seek, but also that social networking, being able to connect with people, employers, and other companies, and developing those, that emotional intelligence, and also the soft skills needed to be able to communicate and be successful in the working field. These together give them the ability to strive. It gives them the passion, it gives them the curiosity to really be able to go out in the work field and accomplish great things. And you can see that in all of these different uh, opportunities, such as the college immersion program here, letting us be here and doing what we're doing right now, as well as participating in the hackathon, and being able to participate in other talks here. The whole mentor and mentee relationship, which I'll go into more depth on the next slide. And then also having passionate instructors. Having instructors that care about teaching the student, teaching the mentee, and telling them 
this is really what I care about in the industry and this is how we do things. But without having that boring, just I'm going to lecture at you and give you all this information, do with it what you want. So having a passionate instructor can be a huge difference for a student. So here's a bit of a mentor process, just very simplified to be kind of the power of peer learning. So we've already talked about hands-on teaching, being able to actually get in there and do configurations, work with fiber optics, work with BGP, all of these big industry terms that we learn in the classroom, but we never might touch on a switch or a command line interface or actually see what that config file looks like. This allows us to build knowledge, building that repertoire of information. That way we can go out in the field and be prepared when we actually are going to start working or doing some of these internships. And finally, accomplishing some objectives within the job. If you have a mentorship program, the mentor should be going through their day and their daily operations, whatever they need to do, and that person should be shadowing, the mentee should be shadowing them, knowing or asking questions and being able to keep up with them and also learn this is what a day-to-day -day job looks like. And what you get out of that is the mentor still completes their job for the day, they still complete all their objectives, but they've gained a greater perspective by talking to the student and seeing where education is currently at and what needs to still be learned. Furthermore, you now have a skilled worker. That mentee has gone through the entire job, they've been immersed in company culture, they've learned the job roles and the technical skills needed to do it, they also have some working experience and that ability to eventually become an employee either with you or somewhere else and have that ability to mentor in the future and complete that cycle. So what happens when you start thinking about a lot of these things? When you think about all the other benefits, possibly the mentee goes back to school and has a lot of friends that are also in that industry, that same field, and now those are a lot of new internship uh, opportunists and people that can go into your company and build your company even more. You also have that mentorship cycle, being able to keep having this cycle repeat and now you're going to have a lot of leaders that have done the mentorship program, have taught and also have been taught. It's a greater connection between the company and, every, and all the employees there. Finally, just giving uh, younger generations like some direct experience and what happens when you institute this throughout college education. These are really big questions but it, not really sure how we're going to do it, and Tyler's going to go into that more. Yeah, so uh, essentially, before I can answer Ryan's question, I really have to focus on the industry advancement, right? So what's good about this is that network is adva uh, advancing at a rapid pace. Um, but what's bad about this is it's difficult uh, for network education, networking education to keep up. Um, it typically seems infeasible that uh, education in this sector can match its advancements due to the financial barriers. Do you have the right lab equipment? Do you have the amount of money to teach faculty? Do you have um, things of that nature? So, uh, so it, it kind of creates a revolving cycle, right? So once I graduate from uh, my network uh, engineering undergraduate degree, um, I'm at the point on the left at the end of that arrow. And then um, I enter the job as a entry-level network engineer. But I have, to t I have to take this very winding road um, that, that this line represents, uh, which is approximately an 18 to a 60 month journey to be where I need to be to be entry level. Um, so with that being said, uh, we need to do something better in the undergraduate degree. Uh, and that comes with like corporate sponsors and things that I'll get into on the next slide. So how, how can companies leave their mark on undergraduate education, particularly in network engineering? You need to invest in the future of your com uh, company uh, and the field itself. So if you, have, um, if you hire somebody who came from another company and they had good internal uh, education and they had uh, good practices, um, it comes back and, and it, it helps you, right? So lending a helping hand to the younger generation would include recommending collegiate cu uh, curriculum changes, uh, donating networking equipment, uh, expanding internship, co-op, mentorship programs, and increase continual education programs for faculty, uh, employees, and students. Um, what good is donating equipment without helping the faculty understand what it does? Um, so making sure that is implemented is very important. Um, yeah, so uh, we would really just like to thank NANOG, uh, especially their college immersion program. Without them, we wouldn't be here. Um, but also, uh, the hardest working professor in computing, Professor Nicole Hands. She's right here. Can you stand up? Can, can, can we ever stand up? Uh, everything from, you know, 
uh, staying up, staying up late, hours uh, 4 a.m., you know, trying to change lab manuals to improve them or to, uh, you know, combat academic dishonesty, she does it. So, yeah, thank you. This is something that we'd like to have a discussion with people. So if uh, you'd like to, we'll be available right after all the lightning talks. Thank you. <laughs> OK, Chris Morrow, if you're here, it's your turn. Otherwise, uh, Rudiger, please come on up. <laughs> so we're, uh, to the people in the back, we're skipping. Um, so Rudiger's talk. Uh, is going to be next. That's uh, so the one that was supposed to be after this. Uh, so skip to the one after this. Yeah, sorry about this. Um, so while, while they're switching the slides, I will introduce you. Uh, Ruder Gervolk is works with Deutsche Telekom, and he's going to tell us about tools for BGP security, running security. Thank you. And as soon as the slides show up. <laughs> yeah, well, OK. Considering that Google is, oh, the timing is not right yet. OK. Uh, uh, okay, I'm Rüdiger Volk. Uh, I have been around uh, actual operational networking since essentially, well, okay, IP networking since uh, essentially 89 summer. I reported first time on the US West Coast about IP act and internet actually working in Europe. Um, and later on, uh, the German telco uh, asked for help for getting something done in the area, and I have been uh, involved in IETF all the time in parallel to being operator. Uh, so I'm going to talk about routing security. Yesterday we had a panel on that, and uh, well, okay, there are many, many factors in, uh, relevant for routing security. Um, and it is important, as I pointed out yesterday, to be precise uh, when talking about uh, <coughs> security. And uh, the RQ spec tool and uh, specification technology that uh, we have done recently is uh, just one factor, uh, or addressing just one factor in the routing security area. Um, but uh, yes, it is trying to be uh, uh, pretty rigid. And the factor is the management of rigid ingress route filters, which has been uh, considered kind of a requirement uh, for everybody all the time, but uh, actually uh, the implementation uh, has been difficult and lacking in many cases. So this is about root prefix filtering and documentation for that, and the question is based on what data can we do this in a pre precise and rigid fashion fashion, and that's been a problem. Our QSpec provides a query specification formalism, um, and well, okay, we will look at the details of that to some extent. We are uh, providing uh, evaluation on the web portal, and we will see at the end a quick look at snapshots of the diag oops, this is this way. Um, of the uh, provided web uh, diagnostics. So the pr traditional problem space is everybody is supposed to document the customer cone by way of uh, registering AS sets in the internet routing registry, the RPSL based databases that are around and that are are uh, fairly badly managed and uh, organized uh, and register root or root 6 objects for the announced routes in this IRR. Uh, quest problems and questions there are. Which IRR is used by who and what is the quality of the data that's still there and is there any authorization for what's put there? 
Um, and uh, uh, that means essentially there is lots of garbage and confusion out there. And uh, to do good filtering, uh, it is essential that you be very selective about the IRR use. Uh, but so far, we do not have uh, a commonly agreed way of uh, uh, telling people which precise way of using the IRR data uh, is supposed to happen. Uh, and much less are there diagnostic tools for figuring out what are murky spots in the data, and uh, the, that would be, of course, uh, a starting point for cleaning up stuff. Uh, now, for a long time, people have been working on RPKI as helping uh, for more secure information for routing security. And we have the RPKI ROAS there, which are looking like the IRR routes, uh, but uh, as a clean thing with authorization in the background and all ni nice things. Uh, and the interesting question is, well, OK, how can we make use of the old and the new stuff in the most, uh, in the best way. Uh, RQ-spec uh, actually is, uh, I think, uh, a nice step forward in doing this. We have a precise and concise definition of what, uh, how, how to query the databases in combination. Um, the combination uh, 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 makes full use of the old and the new, and thus enables a smooth progress towards more use of the new authorized system. Uh, the implementation is not just the specification formalism, but we have the tools to actually evaluate according to the specification. Uh, and that's implemented, uh, first of all, as a command line tool, as is usually integrated in generating configuration tools, uh, tool chains. But we also have uh, make the stuff available as a web-based service. And this includes not just generating filters, but also providing diagnostic information. Um, Okay, and uh, so let me try to speed up. Uh, well, okay, the formalism is essentially defined using XL, XML schema, which we will be hiding behind a uh, web UI. Uh, there is an XML, XSLT rule set that uh, helps to actually uh, define and implement the semantics of the schema. And we have the implementation at the moment at a pilot stage for use uh, internally within the Deutsche Telekom group. Uh, obviously, what we are showing is, I think, something that would be useful as a public service. Oops. So, this is uh, a sketch of, uh, well, okay, how the schema and its various attributes are presented on the uh, web, uh, web user interface, uh, we have to decide first of all whether we want an evaluation for uh, an AS set or a root set uh, result. Depending on which type of result we want, uh, we have a selection of variants uh, of evaluation modes that may be good for creating filters or that, that may be good for uh, giving you specific diagnostic hints about stuff that looks not good. And then we have uh, a field where the IRR data uh, uh, sources uh, can be selected and it is a little bit more sophisticated than what you are used to uh, in the old time standard IRR uh, evaluation tools. Um, 
Uh, okay, I have to speed up and uh, uh, there are different variants for the AS sets. Uh, there is the standard plane thing and then there are things like, well, okay, we expose and give you the ASs that are in the AS set that are actually not supposed to show up anywhere because IENA has, has still reserved them. And in practice, this, this is seen all the time. And uh, ASs that have been uh, allocated by IENA to RIRs, but the RIRs have returned them into the free pools is more frequent by at least an order of magnitude. So that's obviously useful um, <clears throat> diagnostic information for pointing people to, to bad spots in their data. Um, for the root set, the variants are actually uh, more interesting. We have the, use, the, the usual old plain IRR uh, resolution. We also have a variant where we say, please give me just the ROAS for the ASs that are the argument in the evaluation. And then we can also do variance views of the IRR data classified according to the origin validation of RPKI, where it is in particular inter of interest to flag the routes that we find in the IRR that are invalid. And uh, for making a good combined use, uh, we have the R clean thing, which is the filter to be generated in the future, where we actually only use the RPKI validated clean IRR data and enrich that by adding all the good ROA information from the R RPKI. Uh, so, uh, I was talking, we have a customer analysis website presentation and that essentially uh, 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 provides two views, one of the AS set with all the variants, and oh, I, it would be really nice to have a pointer here. Um, what, we, what, what I can point to, there is the bad rears uh, column that you see, and there we have an example where an AS that is actually not valid to use according to RIR data is flagged in, in the bad rears column. And uh, yeah, well, okay, for the curious, seeing which ASs that are in the set actually have ROAS uh, may be of interest, but uh, well, okay, that's not uh, that crucial. Uh, for the <clears throat> Sorry, uh, for the uh, root set uh, diagnostic page, we have more variants, and uh, the example uh, shows, and this is all real data. I only had to censor a little, oops, back. Uh, I only had to, to censor the actual prefix information for uh, legal reasons. Um, and uh, a, you see there is almost, you know, there is more than 10% of the number of routes that are in the IRR uh, is actually flagged as, uh, as uh, origin validation invalid. That should not be the case. And we are seeing uh, in the bottom three lines actually examples of uh, uh, root objects from the IRR that are to, that better should be ignored according to RPKI. So, oops, that should not be there, and that should not be there, uh, or well, okay, this, the, the, these, two, uh, these two slides were meant as uh, essentially bonus, I don't want to talk about it. Uh, quite obviously, there is considerably more to talk about, Helpful diagnostics, 
beyond what uh, I presented in the UI are there, there should be hints and suggested procedures for analysis and improving the data. Uh, uh, the underlying mechanics of doing the RQ spec and its implementation. Uh, well, okay, see and invite me for more detailed presentations or workshops in the future. And quite obviously, uh, uh, the question of how, where, when uh, a, a web service might be ready and available for whom uh, would be an interesting point to discuss. Takeaways, uh, I think our, our QSpec provides a concise notation for using RPKI and IRR databases for documenting your customer routes. It provides tool for evaluation of this, for creating rigid ingress pro route filters and diagnostics to identify murky spots in IRR data to help, uh, to help clean up, and it encourages creating authoritative data in RPKI to be used with priority in conjunction with remaining data from the o, uh, that is still only covered in the murky IRR. Thank you, Thank you, Rudiger. And with, with, with that, we're, we're actually back on schedule.